Okay, so hi, I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Agalia. And uh, today we have invited uh, a, a guest on. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Zach Leatherman. I'm a staff engineer at Netlify. Nice. A lot of people probably know Zach from uh, a project that he works on. I, how do you say the name of that? It's like <laughs> something with a number. Yeah, it's 11D. Um, it was named many, many years ago by my grandma, I think, before I was even a software developer. But yeah, so. I'm just kidding. I love the name 11D. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really good name. I, I think part of its popularity is probably that it has such a great name. Um, <laughs> also, also, it's really great. We we use it actually for yeah. um, multiple multiple websites at Agalia. So we're, it's not just lip service. We, we really like it. Um, but the name is really its best selling point. It really is pretty good, right? <laughs> I mean, branding is important. So I've heard that. Yeah. 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 That's between 11T and uh, uh, opossums. I, I think you've got the brand on lock. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I wonder if we were an early adopter of possum culture generally. It seems like possums have, uh, yeah, grown in popularity recently. And that's, yeah. it's great to see it. I think I think that's all down to eleven E. Why did you pick possums out of curiosity? Um, I I just kind of see the mindset of the possum to be very similar to just an open source maintainer mindset in that you're just sort mm -hmm. of rooting through trash to try and find some sort of sustenance to keep you moving forward. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. I love it. Okay. So um <laughs> Zach, uh, you uh, wrote a blog post uh, like fairly recently uh, talking about yeah. something about um, some things that happened along the way with Eleventy. And um, I don't know, would you like to kind of give us like a high level if anybody hasn't read it? Yeah, for sure. So Eleventy sort of started, I think, in like late 2017. Um and for many years, it was a side project. It was I worked on it in my free time. Um, yeah, and I just sort of maintained it with however many hours in the day that I could fit into the project um, outside of my normal nine to five. And I think in early 2022, that uh, scenario changed and that I was sponsored by Netlify specifically to work on 11D full time. So 11D graduated from a side project to my full-time job working on 11 was my full-time job so yeah it was awesome uh and then uh probably a month or two ago that scenario changed um and yeah it's back as a side project again um so i have a nine to five job and I'm sort of navigating the complexity of downgrading the amount of time that i have to work on it every week yeah um it, it's like uh familiar story the start of that right i mean everybody starts a project because they like have an interest they they think there's a need mm -hmm. like i don't know if you set out to make like a super great thing or you just set out to say like i have some ideas i think these would be useful to me like i want to play with it and see where it goes or like you just really set out to you know sort of conquer the world from day one <laughs> i think it was a little bit of a mixture of both Really? Okay. Uh, I saw some maybe larger trends at the time when I started working on the project um, in terms of just the complexity of front end and front end technology stacks. And I thought I could simplify it. Um, and I think that that came to fruition in some ways. Um, and I think you can kind of see some of those echoes reverberating in different projects that exist now. So um, I think that there is like a huge what? push for. Well, just in terms of the single page application thing, I think was a huge driver uh, of 11D originally. I think 11D and Gatsby started in the same year, huh. uh, which is sort of interesting to think back on. Um, but yeah, I think there was a huge push to do more single page application framework things and front end sort of really tried to move into that space exclusively. Um, and I thought that there was just room for a, a sort of classic way to build websites that didn't require heavier front ends. Um, right. And I think that reverberated with a lot of folks too. And that's why 11D sort of took off. 
Mm. So, so you're you're saying websites should have more than a single page? Is that is that what we're getting at here? <laughs> I think that there is a, a certain complexity that comes with uh, trying to shoehorn everything into a single page for sure. Mm. Um, and at least two. You should have at least two, I think is what Zach's saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're getting paid by the page, you definitely want oh, multiple totally. pages just to pad your paycheck for sure. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Okay. Um, so what you're describing though is like a, a challenge and what you talk about a lot in the in the post is like, boy, this has me thinking a lot about like open source and how it's funded and um it it feels to me like you um like you have evolved your thinking on this a little bit mm. yeah, am i and, wrong and, am i wrong yeah, and part of the reason that that we wanted to talk to you is because we also think a lot about open source and funding of projects um Brian and I individually and also at Agalia and you know to have the perspective of someone who's actually like done that right you actually did get your open source project funded um both mm. both as a side project and then as a full-time project and now back as a side project again and yeah some of the stuff you wrote about like brian says it, it did seem like your your thinking has evolved a bit and we really wanted to talk to you about that and get your get your perspective yeah, and I don't know that I actually have uh, the most clarity on the subject, too. I think everything is still very fresh, and mm. um, yeah, it's kind of raw right now. Um, and so, yeah, it really has me sort of rethinking a lot of things that I brought into the project originally. Um, I think that when you're funding, when you have funding, it's great, uh, and you build as many things as you can in that time that you're given. Um, but I think looking back on the things that I built, I wonder if I built some things that maybe were not as sustainable um, and things that were maybe more of uh, an attention play or trying to get more market share mm -hmm. rather than things that um, were long term sustainable. Because mm -hmm. I think I kind of knew going into it that if you are open, if your open source project is fully funded, it isn't necessarily the most uh, secure financial position to be in, in terms of uh, company support. I think that um, if your project is not necessarily directly tied to a company's bottom line, and that way you almost become the most expendable mm -hmm. uh, when the market gets rough. Um, right. And I mean, that isn't even necessarily a bad reflection on Netlify either. It's just, um, times change and business priorities change and um, yeah, just everybody's just trying to navigate the best way they can. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this um, in terms of uh, all different sorts of things, but primarily, you know, on our show, we talk about the open source things that Egalia works on, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a yeah. lot. Uh, we work on uh, the web engines, but we also work on like open source graphics drivers and multimedia and, you know, just so many things. Um, but it, you know, it's interesting to think about because on the one hand, open source is like this great commons, but it's like a commons with no inherent funding model. <laughs> yeah. And like also it powers everything, you know, like it powers just everything. Um, and it, it's interesting to think about like uh, a bajillion people use 11 now. Right. Um, I don't know if the number is quite that much. But I measured it. Was a, it was a little over a bajillion. Uh, yeah, um, at least 11 people. Bajillion. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's at least 11 bajillion people. Um, you know, a lot of people use, the software, you know, and, and like, uh, you know, how long can you really keep it going? You know, I mean, that's, that's the question. I mean, you know, inevitably you need kind of more than a single person, even, you know, like you need mm. other people because you, you burn out and just, just like you're saying about Netlify, like your life will change. Right. I mean, I don't know, like, 
you have life events where you're, you like your priorities in life change and you go, boy, mm -hmm. I mean, I love this project, but I'm kind of kind of past it now. And I just want to move forward. You know, like I would like to have some advisory role in it maybe or, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think yeah. that that's maybe common for a lot of folks working on open source projects. I don't know that that's necessarily the case for 11D specifically. I still have like this incredible passion for the project and, um, like a desire for 11D to continue forward. Uh, I think that the, the, I don't know, some of the things that I've sort of been thinking about as this situation for 11D changed was how would the scenario have been different if I had talked to investors when they wanted to talk to me a few years ago? Um, and I sort of wanted to keep 11D as an independent thing that didn't have a lot of external roadmap or a lot of tight coupling to business cases that were maybe tied to things that I wasn't interested in. Right. Uh, or maybe going down roads that would have burned me out much quicker. Mm -hmm. I think that just burnout is sort of, I feel like tied very closely to having to work on things that you don't want to work on. Uh, Definitely. And I've really tried to organize 11 in such a way that I don't have to make hard decisions and in, in that space, at least. Um, so yeah, I think that just on the flip side of that coin is that, uh, I think that we'll probably retire a few 11 plugins that we developed last year that don't have the, uh, the desire from the original maintainer, uh, namely me to work on them. Uh, and we sort of put out a survey for, folks to participate and tell us what plugins they wanted to see continue forward. And we're trying to sort of narrow things down um, to sort of avoid that long-term burnout that I think would be very easy to uh, encounter with just a severe reduction in, in time to work on the project. Yeah. yeah. And what, what do you plan to do with the plugins that don't make the cut? You just sort of put them up and encourage someone else to pick them up or? Yeah, I mean, that's one option. I think that um, the sort of the really weird scenario that I'm in is that some of the least popular ones are the ones that are tightly coupled or more tightly coupled to Netlify specific features. And so it becomes this very awkward conversation of, uh, am I going to work on Netlify things as an open source project, even though I am employed by Netlify? but they aren't paying me to work on this stuff specifically. So it almost becomes a, a, a monetary conversation with Netlify to say, hey, if, if my current employer wants these integrations to continue existing um, and they have customers that are using these integrations, then we need to figure something else out, which I think is just a very, kind of an awkward thing to, <laughs> to talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can appreciate that. But, but you're right. You should have that conversation. Yeah, because um, I'm not going to do it for free in my right. in my spare time. Yeah, I, I think this is like uh, we talked about this a bunch of times on the show. Is like there are unbelievably good things about open source, right? I mean, like it mm. it lets it lets us stand on top of you know each other's shoulders. It lets us build a commons. It lets us like rapidly prototype things. And it lets some companies even become fantastically wealthy, mm. but it doesn't demand anything back necessarily. <laughs> and that yeah. is also like a little bit a problem, right? Because when things become fantastically successful and fantastically, you know, fantastically wealthy companies and products are built on them, suddenly they have demands on maintainers that, you know, even the maintainers were not, didn't mean to sign up for kind of, you know what I mean? Uh, they don't have a, a monetary, a, a monetary model behind it. And it's really challenging. Um, I know in your piece, you wrote about like how all these other frameworks, uh, you looked kind of specifically at a, a slice of similar ish frameworks. Is that fair to say or? Yeah, in the open source yeah. monetization post. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. The JavaScript um, ecosystem in a way. Yeah. 
Um, and it's tricky, right? <laughs> uh, there's lots of open collectives now. Um, I, I haven't looked at them. Like, do you know how well they're doing? Some, I, I can tell you some things do really pretty well and others not so much. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of, I don't, uh, yeah, it's not really, I don't know if I know the best way to bifurcate the projects that are doing well on open collective and on ones that aren't, I would say that 11D is doing well in that we have a lot of individual contributors donating to the project, um, which I think will be good as we enter our next phase of not having full-time sponsorship. Um, we can then leverage that money to sort of uh, pay for contributions to the project, which I think is good. Um, and it's it's a little awkward because it, in some respects, I feel like if a project has full-time maintenance, um, it almost hurts its ability to have uh, individual contributor donations come in um, mm. because I mean, folks don't want to, I mean, it's to me, it's, it almost a similar parallel is when you think about cli climate change in a way um, that all of these super mega corporations are sort of doing most of the polluting, but all of the sort of marketing you hear around it is that we need everyone to do their fair share when it's really like 10 companies are doing the lion's share of the pollution. Um, and it, it's almost a, a same reflection in the open source monetization space, right? You, Everyone's saying, oh, if we, we, we could just chip in $5 a month, then we can fund this project if we get enough people. But just as someone that's that's sort of done the math on that, uh, $5 a month is not enough. <laughs> Um, even when you have hundreds of contributors, $5 is not enough for a full-time salary. Mm. Uh, and there's a bunch of like other, uh, variables that go into that, right? Like I'm a staff engineer. I'm fairly w well along in my career. Um, if I were at the beginning of my career, it might be easier to, uh, fund and open like a full-time, uh, salary. Um, and I think the other thing that sort of ties into it is where folks live, right? If you, if your cost of living is yeah. New York city in the United <laughs> States, um, it becomes a completely different thing. But I think the other sort of weird aspect of that, that I'm, I've been thinking about a lot is just living in the United States. Generally, there's a higher cost of living associated with that. I got to pay for my own insurance. If I don't have an employer, uh, I have to pay for health insurance, which is uh, very expensive in the U.S. Yeah. So in some ways, it feels like if I lived in a country that uh, had, uh, I don't know, more uh, options for health insurance to pay for it, um, that it would make it easier to sort of transition to uh, a community-funded salary for 11D. But that right. is what it is. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I've had Europeans say, "How do you? How does anyone ever do anything independent in the U.S. when your healthcare isn't covered?" Yeah, like how does anybody ever strike out on their own? It's like, yeah, <laughs> by taking a huge risk. Yeah, yeah. By, yeah, by it's and just the money is not is not really there for the risks that folks would be taking to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in my mind, that that answers the question that you need to be coupled to a business. You need to have some sort of business or monetization strategy around your open source project. Um, otherwise, it, it won't su succeed. I feel like the other maybe interesting piece of this is that uh, there's this maybe feeling of... Um, meritocracy and meritocracy is what decides what projects are successful. Uh, and I do not think that that is true. <laughs> I don't think that could be any further from the truth. I think the, th the things that you hear about in the th projects that are successful are just really tied to um, the business case around them um, and how much money they have behind them and how much economic momentum they, they built up. 
So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I have learned a lot about just open source maintenance in general and sort of opened my eyes in a, in a way to, to, yeah, just sustainability, generally speaking. I don't think that most projects will not be able to be successful from uh, small open collective donations. I don't think that is a sustainable way forward, unfortunately. Yeah, there's so much in what you said there. Um, like one is about uh, meritocracy. And yeah, I mean, sure, there's something to like, it has to be decent, right? <laughs> but yeah. uh, but the like the best technology never wins. Like really, like the <laughs> re like really. No, I mean, yeah. I I know, I know. I've had a lot of people even like cut me off from saying this because I say it so much, and they're like, "I know, we've heard you <laughs> heard you say this a lot of times." <laughs> but but you know, like it is a lot like evolution, and like you know, you wind up with all these things that are like weirdly imperfect, but like they just happen to fill the right niche, and they just mm -hmm. happen to be in the right place at the right time. Right. I mean, maybe, um, and I think it's a lot like that with, uh, you know, every, not, not just software, but like every product, right. I mean, like VHS was not, I was not the best at the time. Yeah. Um, and it won, you know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, the reason folks have heard about 11D is because in many respects it was in the right place at the right time and we had a lot of luck that went into that um because it did just start as just a thing to scratch my own itch and it scratched i guess similar itches and other people at the same time and it was really as as the complexity and front end had started to get away from a lot of projects um so i, I mean it's just hard to sort of have awareness of both sides of the thing and try to try and keep your perspective uh, in a way that doesn't make you cynical moving forward. Um, I, I feel like the number one emotion that I battle in my day-to-day -day life is just cynicism. And I'm just really, just really trying to not end up in a cynical place. Um, so, yeah. That is what it is also. <laughs> In your post, you compared a, a, a particular slice of frameworks, but they're not even the only slice. I mean, there's also mm. the corresponding ones in, you know, PHP and there's the corresponding ones in Java and the corresponding ones in .NET. And sometimes they have sort of like a spinoff version for some other like this is the one for go this is the one for python but they're they're mm -hmm. the same but not really like they they're actually separate code bases but they're just very very similar and so like investment into any of these is who is going to invest in this project is largely a subset of who sees the value in it right like it's tricky you got to tap into a really huge audience to see the value in your thing to get any real money and so like 11d has like done honestly pretty well like i look at the uh, the open collective but you're right i mean if you have hundreds of people currently you i think you have like four or five hundred people um or four or five hundred individual contributors that in some cases are companies or other open source projects or whatever um, yeah, not active. I think we have a couple hundred active monthly contributors. I mean, that's kind of the other, the other math thing that goes into this, right? Is that some folks like to do a one-time donation, um, and those are extremely hard to uh, rely on. How do you do the math of trying to sustain your project from a one-time donation? I don't. That to me, I, I would rather see a uh, hundred tiny monthly donations than. Uh, a one-time donation because it's just easier to sustain moving forward. You know, this is like products that have some kind of business model. They do this, they figure it out and they make a profit. And like here, we don't even need to make a profit, right? We just need to figure out a way to pay the bills and, and keep the lights on. So it's tricky to make people see yeah. the value in that. So we think about this a lot for the web engines. Like currently... 
we have this model where uh, we have three and they're all, mm. they all have like a steward, you know, but the stewards are two really, really giant companies yeah, at different kinds of companies too. Like they're very different kinds of companies and a foundation and the foundation kind of gets all of its money from one of those companies. <laughs> So yeah, other people do contribute, but when you like, and it's important that the other people contribute, like it, we see great things when that happens, but it's, it's not enough. I mean, there's still so many, there's still hundreds of proposals and improvements and things that are just sitting there, even some old ones, you know, uh, we want to get really good print support, but who's investing in that, for example, you know, um, we want to keep MathML going. That's, that's actually a, a great example. Yeah. Egalia worked on MathML and we worked from multiple funding sources including an open collective. And we got two big individual donations from yeah. MathML. Um, one for $50,000 and one for 25,000. These are from people like single people, not, not companies. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, there's a uh, maybe 20 or something of, people who give, you know, $5 a month or $10 a month or something like that. But, you know, at that rate, you know, like you can't sustain something based on that. It's completely unpredictable because it's just, it's not, it's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's the, what's the pricing difference between the initial investment and what it takes for maintenance of that specific feature? I think, yeah, original development might be what folks would consider the, the huge piece of the project that goes into it at the beginning but uh you still have to software is never done right you have to maintain it that's um, absolutely true like we need to get past um you know sort of like level one in all the browsers that we hmm. we don't have good parity uh, on a couple of things yet but it like it it's just the most basic stuff and like we need to get past that to get other stuff and even if we didn't have that, they're just like, just to keep the software functioning to prevent bit rot as things happen in the other layers of the platform and things are re-architected, like that introduces bugs and like you have to catch those bugs, you have to fix those bugs, you know, and if, if everybody's like, well, you know, mathematical, it's not really important uh, or SVG is another example because it's, mm. it's also and also ran to HTML, you know. Uh, there's just, there's not a lot of investment in those and it's kind of a shame. We invest in those and we try our best to find other companies who can invest in them and, uh, even, you know, individual contributors. And we, we realize what a hard, <laughs> what a hard thing that is to, to raise that kind of money for. Yeah. It's, it's the math ML to SVG comparison too feels very interesting to me because it, it would almost seem like SVG investment, it, it would be so much more easier to crowdsource that. And just because the usage of SVG is so much more popular and math, math ML is maybe a little bit more esoteric. Um, and it's just not as widely used, I think in day-to-day -day web stuff. Um, yeah, that's probably true. But, you know, I think, I think the difficulty would be, you know, hey, we have an open collective for SVG implementation. And I think most people would think, <laughs> why, why are you asking me? Like, why, why should I be contributing money to SVG? I didn't contribute any money to yeah. JPEG or, or PNG implementations. Those happened. Those seem to be okay. What, what's this about, you know? And yes, I think a lot of people would, would get it, but there's still sort of that, that barrier of this isn't, it's not my job to like as a web developer, it's not my job to fund browsers development. It's, it's my job to like develop things in those browsers and actually get paid for that. And Unfortunately, it is difficult sometimes to make the the clear argument that yeah there's it's an ecosystem right it's not a hierarchy and i I expect you probably ran into that some in trying to you know uh get support for eleventy 
from the community. I mean, there are people who, of course, immediately get it and they're happy to pitch in five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever a month Mm -hmm. to see a thing that they want progress. But there are probably plenty of people and I would imagine plenty of companies who said, you know, when I pay for software, it comes with, you know, it's, it's software that has support contracts and licenses and stuff. And open source is, you know, free yeah. commie, et cetera. And yeah, I, why, you know, why would we pay for that? I feel like with web browser specifically or web engine specifically there, I, I am sort of of the old school mindset too. And I remember just folks forming businesses on the backs of web browsers. I remember, yeah, Netscape originally was a a company. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that just the historical perspective of that now seems very strange, right? We have an engine, a couple of engines that serve giant business use cases that are sort of orthogonal to the the engine itself. Um, and so there's almost two different classes of projects that we're talking about now, because I feel like with the Levity specifically, it's maybe easier to sell to an individual contributor because the individual contributor is sort of using it to build things that they're maybe making money from. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. It's a strange, I don't know. Paradox is the wrong word. But it's a strange juxtaposition, though, right? Because almost every company in the world at this point does rely on those engines, right? Right. Uh, even the ones that you don't think about, like when you get in your car, when you drive down the road, and you see digital signage, like point of sale systems, like it, everything is web web engines, like everything. Mm. Yeah, to to an astonishing degree. <laughs> The James Webb Space Telescope runs on JavaScript. Yeah. So <laughs> nice, yeah. So I mean, it's an astounding number of things that rely on that, and we we rely on these these really centralized sources for for funding them. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about too, because you know, like you were saying, like, well, it's no comment on Netlify. Like they just like the business changed, their priorities changed. Like mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't a guarantee. It's not like a core part of their business. Like they didn't sort of integrate it into like, no, this is Netlify. Yeah. But you know, Safari isn't Apple and Chrome isn't Google. Do you know what I mean? Like they're their own yeah. businesses. Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, the web is just like this giant group project <laughs> that we're all sort of participating on. And yeah. engines are one piece of that. And frameworks are another piece of that. And, uh, yeah, it's it's companies come and go over the years, and I've been in the game long enough to see many of those sort of larger trends happen. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I have a point other than uh, just to say that I feel like that's natural. Um, and the reason the web has had so much longevity is because it is insulated in that way. But when it comes to uh, web engine monoculture... <laughs> Um, it's a scary thing to think about that um, that we have uh, just a couple of engines and uh, it seems scarier and scarier if we go down to a single engine that the money behind that could dry up and that would be a very dangerous thing for the web. Yeah, I, w- I mean, I would posit that, well, the money for the two, at least, will disappear at some point. Um, mm. like it's inevitable because no company relies, no, no company remains at the position that they're at forever. Right. Like now it might be in 50 years, <laughs> but inevitably, you know, inevitably that will change, you know, there's a, another project that we could maybe mention and talk about and think about, which is open web docs. Do you know open web docs? I do. Yeah. They, uh, their website runs on eleven D. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, that is an effort that uses Open Collective as well. It takes in a, a goodly amount of money, and I think that it helps solve some of those problems that you were talking about. About like it's hard to not work for a company 
and and to work on stuff like this. Mm. But it it's interesting, like because there is no single company behind it now. What happens there is, is that still you get a few big, like a few big ones, right? A few big fish that are paying for most of it. But at least it's a few, right? Like Microsoft has given $750,000. Google has given $750,000. Facebook has given $250,000. Uh, Coil gave $100,000 when it was still around. Um. Mm. Egalia has given I don't know sixty thousand dollars. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what do what you think the about fundraising? What was the fundraising strategy behind that? Was it how was that pitched to those large companies? Um, I'd be very interested to learn <laughs> because, in in many respects, it feels like a marketing play in some uh, in some way because you're putting your name alongside the maintenance of this uh, sort of web documentation that's a resource for everyone um but how do we get away from the idea that that is an altruistic thing and have it tied more to this is a thing that we need for the web to survive um because when a when a company thinks of open source as altruism it's not going to be sustainable long term uh and so yeah maybe you'll get uh, almost $2 million in, in donations from large companies. But is how many years is that going to buy us, um, for maintenance of that project? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. And it, it is very hard to plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you, you can't know exactly what's going to come in, but what you have to do is, you know, aim for certain kinds of things and always keep, being out there talking about it in a way. Um, yeah. How was it sold? I mean, I think it was sold largely by people. So lots of people, lots, basically people from Google and Microsoft and Apple, you know, contribute to MDN, like all the browsers contribute mm. to MDN. And there were even efforts at, at different times to, to create a thing like MDN to, to even replace MDN at W3C. There was an effort called Web Platform Docs. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, yeah, a little um, bit. But that was like a W3C effort. Uh, and then it just became like, well, I mean, why? MDN has kind of won this. Like they're employing staff writers. They have the thing. They're like every search engine indexes to them for things now. Like they're it's no longer W3 schools winning everything. Yeah. So that's a hard fought battle to get those things and like, why fight that, you know? So, you know, the funding for it from Mozilla was like all the staff writers were getting laid off. And that is actually a really big chunk of the work is people who are employed mm -hmm. to just maintain and, and write content, you know? So, yeah. And it would be a great disservice to adopt a Wikipedia style model. <laughs> where it's just mm. anyone can contribute anything and the the pay goes in as sort of at the moderator level um, where, yeah, it's just community written, but uh, business moderated. And yeah, they just ask for money <laughs> every year. So yeah. yeah. I don't know. In some respects, I, I feel almost like uh, a politician in a way. <laughs> that uh, is just trying to raise money most of the time and then doing the job, the actual job of writing code very little. But I feel like that's a common thing as you get more senior in your career that I wish were not true. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really glad that you said a politician because I, there was another aspect of this that I wanted to talk about. I, several people have like cited me for this um but the idea was not mine it's not even new the reason i brought it up in some other cases was because uh nicholas zakis you know Slicknet, um yeah said it to me in a private conversation and i thought well yeah why is nobody pushing that button which is like are there things that the government can do for this because it is a commons right mm -hmm. i mean we, we make this case that it's a commons that, that these things are like the roads and bridges right their infrastructure they're dependent on by everybody. Like, how can we not fund them? Yeah, I think the German government does actually have a, a 
uh, program going right now. I forget what the program is called off the top of my head. Bail fund. And I think last year the U.S. did something uh, where they did some fund for um, security stuff on on open source uh, projects. That was after that uh, log4j issue yeah. in Java that yeah. was like bad. But short of that, the actual idea that I was mentioning is if you could get tax credits, you know, like mm -hmm. you get a, a tax write off for donating to some of these projects more businesses would do it, you know, because it, mm. it, and it's kind of, re it's like revenue neutral for them, you know, like, yeah. So it, it really would feather out the, the thing that you're talking about where it's like, well, this is, this is not our core business, you know? So it's just, it's all cost for us. Like we have to just, it's the, the first thing on the shopping block. Actually open source would have an advantage if that was the case. The, the challenge is how do you identify like which things qualify? <laughs> For mm -hmm. that it could it probably couldn't be everything right yeah yeah although i don't know because and yeah, i suppose there would probably have to be a parallel structure to the like nonprofit, the way nonprofits are structured in various countries where you register as a in the u.s it's a 501c something or other c3 c4 and then you can report on your taxes that you donated to a a 501c3 or 4 or whatever it is and the government has a record of oh yes that's a thing that we recognize so you'd end up having to have projects registering with the open source project you know registry whatever with a government issued id number of some sort so that people on their taxes could then say well i donated to this thing you know this project and it has this number and then the projects will probably have to report their yearly yeah i mean if you make that possible there's a, there's infrastructure that has to be set up but i i feel like it would be worth it to be honest because there is so much that is based on open source right so much not open source stuff that's based on open source like you know if 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 you if you rub the magic lamp and the genie comes out and gives you three wishes and one of your wishes is I want all open source software to disappear. Uh, civilization might, might be well and truly over it. <laughs> like, or at least the first world would, yeah. would be crippled for years. Um, because pr basically up, uh, like everything that we do, like nothing is 100% completely clo closed proprietary. Yeah. Yeah. I was just looking at this uh, Open Collective Foundation. It seems like that there's a subset of Open Collective projects that are participating in the Open Collective Foundation that is like a 501c3. Yeah. So if you were to go to our podcast and go back to February 4th, 2021, I talked with uh, Jory. Do you know Jory? Jory Burson. She's from. Linux Foundation. I know of them. And yeah. uh, OpenJS Foundation. And uh, and Pia Mancini. I don't know if you know who she is, but she's, For sure. yeah. she's one of the people behind Open Collective. And if you ever heard her, she had like a TED Talk and lots of on the origins of this. You know, this was originally about government. There are places in the world where there is like citizens can do this. It's it's sort of, it's a very interesting idea. This this sort of smashing together of these ideas, but like the idea of uh, I think Eric is is sort of right. If we created something that was like a little bit paper heavy and maybe like involved some minor legal fees or something, it would prevent just you know every weekend project I have from applying for this. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. What do you think, Zach? Like if there was some government program that you know, was a little bit heavy on the paper, but, you know, would cost you maybe a couple of weekends and $150 in legal fees or something like that. But the advantage is then you could get donations that were tax write-offs. Do you think that that would be worth it to you? I mean, it's, it's, I feel like it's, it's a very hard, almost golden handcuffs situation with any funding source where it almost becomes an all or nothing scenario 
if if it's enough to have a full-time salary then great but if i don't have a full-time salary i i can't i can't go have z's on a full-time salary you know what i mean it's very hard to get paid enough I can't get half a job, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. It's very hard to get half a job and then use the rest of that time. uh, And in a way that I'm able to monetize the rest of that time. Um, So yeah, it almost becomes an all or nothing. Like if it's, if it's enough to sustain a salary, great. I'm in, let's do it. Let's I'll fill out a month's worth of paperwork to do that. Um, But if it's, if it had, if it's halvesies, then it's it's yeah just there's no way to make that leap it's yeah a binary so, thing so the way i think about it is like right now you have your full-time job but then you're putting mm-hmm. in i don't know another five percent ten percent i don't i don't know how many hours you spend but you know so if you could get that ten percent covered i mean you might have that ten percent covered already in the open collective but at least you're getting paid for that work it's not free um mm-hmm. And I think I I dig what you're saying, though, that it's like, um, okay, so what happens when now suddenly it's like 50% comes in? Now I have this glut of money, but I can't, it's not enough for me to quit my job and and do this. (laughs) But I feel like there's all this money sitting there and now I feel bad that I can't spend it. I think actually maybe some other projects do have exactly that problem. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe the super interesting thing that I've been thinking about recently is how a four day work week might affect that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, because if you're four, if you're in a four day work week, then you suddenly have this fifth day to sort of decide to do with what you want. And that mm-hmm. creates a great opportunity for uh, open source participation. Does it change perspectives though, as time goes on? Because like at one point we had a seven day work week and it was just like, you know, do you think that if we were to do zoom, you think we'll trend down to a three day work? If, week? No, no. Do you think that if we were to zoom this into the past, people would have been like, imagine if we could get a five day work week, because then you would have two days that you could work on open source. <laughs> right? Well, just think about it this way. In the first four years of 11D's life, I was working that sixth day. Right. Um, yeah. In many respects, like I was putting hours in on the weekend, hours at night, hours in the morning on top of my 40 day, 40 hour a week job. And so open source is already uh, sort of uh, cannibalizing the free time of people outside of their five day a week jobs. And so, yeah. Yeah, I think it would be great to have a four day work week and then fifth day can be open source. That would be awesome. Yeah. It at um so different places in the world also have different work hour requirements. So uh, mm. at a you know, at a Gallia we have uh seven hour days. Oh nice. So you know, you could choose to spend an hour, like you could choose to say yeah, but I've always lived my life with eight hours and I'm comfortable with eight hours. So I'm going to spend that other hour on stuff I care about. Um, if, you know, that's maybe another avenue toward the same kind of thing that you're saying. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. This is all really fascinating. I mean, uh, because there's just so much. And and like, you know, we didn't even cover, you know, we we talked about 11D. And that it's this like slice of, well, what about Java and .NET and, you know, like all these other things that are pervasive. I mean, there's so many. Yeah. And none of that gets you to like shareable components, which like you also have some like <laughs> seven minute tabs. I know you like that. That's just the cleverest name ever. You're really good with names. I, I think I would like to hire you to name my next project. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's how it should monetize. That is how you should monetize. That, that would you would probably clean up. Um, so everybody needs components, right? Like everybody needs components and Mm. like even less than that, people want just like nice ish, I don't know, atoms to work with, you know, like nicest, nice ish design tokens to work with and things. Yeah. I mean, I I think there's a couple of success stories in terms of project software project monetization that are worth looking at. I think Tailwind has done a great job of monetizing 
their Tailwind Pro component set, uh, which I think maybe fulfills some of that same thing. Um, I think the other sort of aspect that a lot of folks are having success monetizing right now is um, CMSs. It feels like there's a lot of money in CMSs right now um, and businesses are willing to pay for that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, shareable components is, is, is one piece of it, but I think those are, there's a couple of other success stories too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the point that I was going at with the uh, like UI toolkits and things is that, you know, if you like whatever you want, you want tabs, everybody says they want tabs. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a lot to tabs, right? I mean, like you even, we, we worked together just very briefly on the, mm. um, the open UI tabs effort. Um, yeah. And you could see like, there's so many different sort of avenues and perspectives to that. It, they, they multiply essentially. Like you can imagine this is like a tree. So whatever, like the low level thing is, then on top of that, you get 10 things that depend on that. And on top of that, each one of those gets 10 things that depend on that. Yeah. And so the higher level you go, the more you need to like reinvest again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you would think, to some extent that, that, that top level thing would be, people would be like, man, we just need that. And we would be willing to just do that, invest in it one time. Really, really good, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, then it would work everywhere. Primitives. Yeah. Yeah. How do we manage this? I, th I think we just haven't figured it out. I mean, there was, uh, there's also like back your stack. Have you heard of that? Like mm. that, those kinds of things. Is that like a uh, package JSON analyzer? Yeah, it's kind of like one of those things that like tries to pay, you know, tries to pay downstream, yeah. right? I think my question, Zach, is if you if you could open the magic genie lamp and get the genie wishes, yeah, what would you wish for to like sort of fix this problem? Ooh, that is a very good question. My initial reaction was we. Open source just generally needs more leverage against folks that are making money from open source. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of folks are sort of discussing licensing options there. But when you restrict the license, that restricts the just the core nature and the core power of open source generally. And so it's this it's this very difficult sort of tension between these two groups where we want everything to be open. We want everything to be mm -hmm. approachable. Um, but we also want to make money from it in a way that's sustainable. So I, I wish I could, I wish I could fund uh, or figure out how to fund open source in a way that's sustainable from a business standpoint. Uh, I don't know that I have, if I had the answer, uh, I don't think I would be in the current situation that I'm in. <laughs> um, right. Well, but, you know, I figure with a genie magic wand, you get to, you know, change attitudes or whatever, you know, those sorts of things that yeah, are very difficult to do. I think the, like, the best idea that I've come up with over the years is that most companies offer an education stipend. So when you join the company, you get a certain budgetary amount to buy educational resources or go to conferences or what have you. Um, hmm. I would like to see the same stipend and folks to argue for the same stipend for open source donations um, because that money is not nothing. It's uh, somewhat expensive right. to buy uh, a conference ticket. And so if uh, even if folks were able to use their existing stipend to donate to open source projects, I feel like it would be a huge boon to the sustainability story. Um, mm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that would be uh, just a great first step, <laughs> just opening those budgets up to let folks decide how they want to spend their money. Right. Okay. So uh, your, your genie wish is to have it be, be uh, suddenly a cultural norm, like a business cultural norm that, employees have a software, you know, open source support budget or a software support, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Cause that's, that's, a, that's different than the one I was thinking. The thing I was thinking, which sort of 
was leveraging off of the licensing thing you were talking about was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the genie suddenly makes it so that it's, it's a norm that open source licenses have like a revenue threshold oh. where it's open source below a certain revenue threshold and it above a certain revenue threshold, you know, it's $1 per million. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like yeah. the, the genie would also the tiniest create amount. The, <laughs> still be so the good. genie would create, would create the, uh, the, 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 the actual licensing terms so that they actually worked out long-term. Yeah. Like I do not know what that is, but, um, yeah. And, and also the, because it's a genie, it would magically be, you know, legally airtight and <laughs> all that sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, I like, I, I mean, I like your idea. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, both, both ideas appeal to me, but in different ways. Yeah. Like the, the licensing one is more formal, obviously. And it's more sort of, um, it, it, it's it's the sort of thing that open source maintainers could you know could use to mm -hmm. sort of take action as it were yeah. if they needed to but i like the i like the the distributed nature the community nature of the of your funding uh, budget the budgetary idea where companies are just like you know every person that we hire um in addition to $2,500 a year for training, they get a thousand dollars a year for open source support or yeah. whatever amount it is. Yeah. I feel like um, I maybe have a somewhat unique perspective on this, just in terms of before 11 D I just did a ton of just analysis and study on web fonts generally. And I remember yeah. just being so frustrated with web font licensing and how hard it was uh, to just get a hobbyist license for a font and use it mm. on your website because a lot of web font licenses are set up per page view. And that becomes very hard to then use that on your hobbyist site. And I remember being just so frustrated with that at the time, but looking back on it, I feel like I just have a completely different perspective <laughs> in that mm. those fonts would have not existed <laughs> if they weren't licensed in such a way. Um, and the, I feel like just the, the font creation industry in general has a better idea of how to monetize their work than the larger software and maybe like the Kami open source world um, <laughs> does at the same time. And yeah, I just, I guess I feel like I respect that uh, in a way that I did not at the time. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think all of the above, because in a way, we what we need to do is um, admit that we don't know the answers, but we need to kind of bend the arc of history in this direction. <laughs> and I think the only way we do that is by lots of people continuing to talk about it and blog about it like you did, Zach, and tweet about it and toot about it and skeet about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's is there is there one for uh, threads? Threads, yeah. What's what's the what's the threads equivalent of? They need their own word, I suppose. Um, so sewing, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether that's with an E or an uh, an O in sewing. I think needling <laughs> is what they do on there. There you go. Well, actually, we we need something from you, Brian. Um, Zach and I each had our uh, genie wish way to fix this. What's mm -hmm. your genie wish way to fix this? Like if, if, you know, you could have a genie magically change things or create something that would help with us. I, I think if, I think what I would wish for is for more people to understand the problem mm. uh, or problems. And then I think we'll get somewhere, right? I mean, the thing is like, uh, we're not seeing action on like making these things like tax deductible, for example, because there's not enough people, the right people, you know, reaching and, and proposing things to their senators and their congressmen. And um, there's not enough companies 
doing the thing. Some do the thing that Zach said, where we, you know, here's some money you can allocate it to your open source projects. But yeah, I think we would see a lot more experimentation and money flowing through the system if we could make people understand and actually appreciate the problem. Hmm. Um, I think until we really raise awareness, we're very much in like the late 90s web where it's just a comparatively small number of people trying to convince everybody that this is a thing we got to we got to do and we got to do it. Early stages. Yeah. So is there anything, Zach, that you would like to throw out? Like any observations or things you were hoping we would talk about that we didn't talk about or bold statements that you want to make? Predictions for the future? Yeah. Anything. I so. I just, I feel like the, the one thought that I keep having is that I I don't want open source and open source sustainability to be a gig economy thing. I feel like the temptation mm -hmm. is very great to have an Uber for open source where folks show up, fix an issue, get a bounty for it, and then go on their merry way. I don't think that that is a, a healthy or sustainable endpoint for open source generally. Um, we need to be able to have careers that uh, let us live our lives in a way that we're not worried about paycheck to paycheck, what's going on. And there will always be some risk to every job or in every sort of opportunity. But yeah, it would be very, very sad if the end goal of all this sustainability talk were to be a sort of more gig economy based thing. Yeah. Do you think that that's likely? Do you think, like, do you see that? I, I, I sort of don't see it happening because of sort of the things that you said. There are some people who I think that model will suit them really well, you know, like uh, maybe at a certain point in your life, that's yeah. just exactly great for you. You work your own hours, you pick your own mm. things. Yeah. You cash a nice check and then you don't work for a while, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, th I think the, I don't know, just in my own career and in my own life, I have found myself tempted by that. Just even thinking about like the four day work week thing that we talked about in this discussion, like it's sudden that fifth day suddenly becomes the gig economy day where I get to take some of my open, my uh, free time and donate it to the project. And I, it, you can almost see the the end goal of that, right? If you if you have forty hours a week to then dole out as you as you want, then you have no stability of the of the job backing the project, but you have the most amount of freedom, right? So it's always going to be this balance between <laughs> between the two. Um, that everyone's going to have to yeah, manage in their own lives and individually, which is, uh, yeah, hard, a hard thing. Definitely. Eric, do you have anything else? No, I think it's, uh, I think it's time to say thank you. <laughs> okay. Zach, thanks so much for uh, coming on and having this uh, conversation that meandered all through everything <laughs> open source and funding. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for having for me. Entertaining it. Definitely. Yeah, it was delightful. Hope I didn't say anything that will get me in trouble. <laughs> yeah, just a quick note in closing that in between the recording and release of this chat, the situation for Eleven D changed again as Zach announced that he had taken a new job with Cloud Cannon as developer advocate and that this would include some paid time for development and support of the project. So that's great to hear and congratulations to Cloud Cannon.